30. I'm going to go ahead and open the meeting. Like I said, there might be a few more people joining us, and that's fine. Um, my name is Daphne Vincent. I am with Donor Relations at Benavia. We're so glad that you could join us today for this educational event about probate and other misconceptions in estate planning. Um, Benavia has uh, several educational events every year. Some are related to financial and um, estate planning information, and some are related to caregiving journey and so forth. So I'm so glad that you could participate. Um, some of you may have heard about us from getting your on our email lists and um, calendars and you found out, or you may have seen an article in the paper or word of mouth. So regardless of the avenue, we're just so happy you could join us. Um, I'm gonna just give you a quick overview of what Benavia is for those of you, you who don't know. And um, then we will turn it over to our speaker, Mike McGreevy, who we're so pleased to have today. So Benavia has been in existence for 41 years, started um, in 1981 by a group of community members. At the time, Sun City and Sun City um, West were just coming into being and they were up really considered in Timbuktu in the greater um, Phoenix West Valley. Um, at the time, there were not a lot of social services up here. And so a lot of um, people were aging in place and had needs um, to, find caregiving, find um, assisted living uh, residences and so forth. So they just, you know, would have to go into Phoenix to get that. So we just had a lot of need for finding services. So we had people starting at a small, you know, smaller organization. We had a lot of volunteers helping us. So we were able to have some people um, with indicating resources and providing resources for people that were struggling. So one of our biggest programs was our volunteer home services, which goes on to this day, 41 days, 41 years later, we provide free grocery shopping assistance and tr transportation to medical appointments for people who are housebound or are unable to drive. So that's been especially helpful during the pandemic when people who are normally not housebound became housebound during the, the height of the pandemic. And um, so we were able to help a lot of people with, you know, dropping off groceries to their door. You know, they would give someone a list and our volunteers would go out and shop for them and they would drop off the groceries and give them a check for the groceries. So that was a real um, blessing to many. Um, in addition to our free volunteer services, we have caregiver support groups and grief support groups. Those are also free. And there's a whole listing of what we have available on our website, which I will send a follow-up email um, this week to all of you. If you don't know about what our services are with our website link and so forth so that you could find out more. We also have a few, um, four different day programs for seniors or adults with disabilities. Um, that are respite for caregivers and or, you know, socialization, activities, meaningful activities for people with dementia and with intellectual and developmental disabilities. So it's a wonderful way for um, individuals to become more engaged because they're being intellectually stimulated and socially um, involved and not just at home sitting in their armchair all day watching the prices, right? So it really has a great benefit to individuals who you can't stop the dementia, but you can work with what you have to make the most, you know, of the situation. And some, you know, caregivers, they're so busy, they can't even get a haircut, you know, it's get the groceries and they're always worried and that's very stressful on caregivers. So, so that's an important part of our services as well. So anyway, without further ado, I want to introduce to you Mike McGreevy. He's going to speak to us about all things estate planning today. So Mike, if you'd like to say a few words about yourself. Sure. Thank you, Daphne. Um, thank you, everyone, for, for uh, joining us uh, today. I really sincerely appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> so the last time I actually did a Benavia presentation, it was uh, basically just prior to the pandemic. I think it was February 2020. Um, and um, that that presentation focused on just kind of estate planning in general, um, kind of explaining the differences between a will and a trust, that sort of thing. Um, this time I wanted to focus kind of specifically on probate because I get a lot of questions about probate. It, um, 
it, it really isn't the monster that many people uh, create it out to be. But I kind of want to explain what probate is, um, what the process entails, um, how to avoid probate, um, just some things regarding you know probate kind of in general, just so that people have an idea, you know, kind of truly what it is. Um, so I'm going to uh, start sharing my screen um, and starting the presentation, give you a little bit of background of myself um, as well. So bear with me, I'm not 100% awesome at uh, technology. So just bear with me if there's any. Just a housekeeping item. I forgot to mention that we have you all mute currently. So any questions that you have about for Mike, if you just jot them down real quick, and then at the end of the presentation, we'll have a time for question and answers. And then we can unmute you and you can ask your questions, okay? Thank you. All right. All there right, Daphne, does that work? Perfect. All right, so a little bit about me. So I um, basically grew up in Arizona the vast majority of my life. Uh, moved here when I was four years old and have basically been here ever since, except for when I was uh, in college. So I got my Bachelor of Arts in Political Science uh, from the U of A down in Tucson. And then I went to uh, law school up in Michigan um, in, uh, in Lansing, actually. So I got my JD up in Michigan. That was a, a very big change for me, uh, living in uh, the Valley, basically, my entire life and dealing with snow was, uh, was quite an, an undertaking. Um, it, was, it was quite interesting. Uh, but I was glad that I, you know, did it. I really enjoyed Michigan. And, um, you know, now I'm, uh, you know, practicing law. I was partners with my father. Um, he's retired about six years ago now. Um, and he's been, you know, he practiced in, in the Sun City, Sun City area for almost 30 years. So for some of you that have been around in the Sun City area, um, you may recognize the last name. He uh, opened up his own office, um, but at one point he was working for Valley National Bank and um, a variety of banks in, uh, in the Sun City area. So next up, topics. So some of the topics I'm going to cover, uh, the difference between test state and intest state how probate is actually triggered, what does probate entail, just some common misconceptions about probate and how to avoid probate as well. Disclaimer, of course, I'm an attorney. That's one of, gonna be one of the first things that I do is provide a, dis a disclaimer. Um, so the information that I'm providing uh, you know, today is just for educational purposes. It is not legal advice. Um, every family's estate plan is unique. So if I provide information that's inconsistent with how your estate plan is set up, it doesn't necessarily mean your estate plan is wrong. Um, so really that again is kind of the reason why I'm focusing on probate. I kind of want to break things down a little bit, um, you know, so there's some more clarity, so to speak, um, because it can be very difficult just kind of generically speaking about, um, you know, creating an estate plan because everybody's situation is so different. Everyone's finances are different. Everyone's family circumstances are different, so on and so forth. Um, so again, just because I say something um, that's different than what you currently have doesn't necessarily mean that it's wrong. And again, if you do have questions, the most important thing you need to do is reach out to an attorney um, and, and get those questions answered. So first up, we're going to talk about testate versus intestate. So what testate means is that somebody passed away with a last will and testament. So you are going to see a, a little bit of legal jargon today. I'll try to, uh, um, you know, point that out for you. So the decedent, um, that means the person who's passed away. And so when somebody passes away testate with a will, the terms of the will obviously determine who's going to be the personal representative, the person who's in charge of the will, and who are the heirs going to be, essentially who gets what. When somebody passes away in testate, that means without a will. And so when somebody passes away without a will, you look to state statutes to determine priority, basically who has the ability to serve as the personal representative or executor, and who's actually going to get the assets, who are the heirs going to be. 
So the first uh, statute that I want to get into is ARS 143203. And so this is priority among persons seeking appointment if there is no will. So this is intestate. So obviously at one there, person nominated a will. So if you do have a will, the person who's nominated, they serve. If you don't have a will, it would be your surviving spouse. Beyond that, it would be the devisees of the decedent. So those named in a will, if the nominated person fails. So those named as uh, basically to receive something, they could serve. Heirs of the decedent, um, that means essentially the children, the family members, so to speak. Um, if there's no family involved, it could be the Department of Veteran Affairs, or it could even actually be a creditor. So for instance, if you didn't have any family members um, able or willing to uh, handle your estate and you had debts owed, um, technically even a creditor could um, serve as a personal representative and settle your estate. So at number, uh, number four, heirs of the CD, um, the vast majority of, of uh, you know, one through six is pretty, you know, pretty self-explanatory. But number four and number three actually are, you, are where you start to get into some issues because heirs of the decedent, um, say for instance, if you had two children and you passed away without a will and um, you, know, you didn't have a spouse um, or the spouse had uh, passed away before you, your two children would have equal priority. So essentially, if they don't get along, um, you, know, you may have some disharmony basically in determining who's going to be the person who's handling the estate. So that's why it's very important to get some sort of estate plan um, you know, in place, make sure that it's not the state statutes that's determining how things are handled. It's you that's determining how things are handled. The next statute I want to talk about is ARS 14-2103. And so this is heirs other than the surviving spouse. So this would be a situation um, basically if there is no surviving spouse, where do the assets go if you don't have a will? So it goes to the descendants, the children, by representation. If there are no descendants, it goes to the surviving parents. So it goes basically up. If there is no descendants or surviving parents uh, to the parent siblings, and then ultimately to the grandparents. So there is kind of a pecking order. It generally only goes to the children. Um, you know, the, the instance where it goes to the surviving parents, um, really the only times I've, I've seen that circumstance is if it's, um, you know, a, uh, a child that passes away, that sort of, that, you know, those sorts of circumstances. I've actually never seen it get out to the point where it would go to the grandparents. Um, so that just kind of gives you a general idea as to it normally goes to the spouse. If there is no spouse, it's generally equally between the children. But that being said, there is a caveat to that. And so, and that is ARS 14-2102 in-state share of a surviving spouse. So generally, I, like I said, if you have a surviving spouse pursuant to statute, everything goes to the spouse. But if, you're, um, if the decedent passed away and they had children from a previous relationship, so if it was a second marriage, essentially what happens is, is one half of the state goes to the surviving spouse and one half to the children from a previous marriage. So ARS 14-2102 is a reason why anyone who has children from a previous marriage should absolutely have a will because that way you get to decide where your assets go. You may want, you may want it that way. You may want half of your assets to go to your current spouse and half of your assets to go to your children from a previous marriage. But if not, you need to get something in place changing that. So that's just kind of a very important point that I wanna point out. If you do have children from a previous relationship or you know people with children from a previous relationship, they need to get an estate plan in place. Next up, I wanna talk about what is probate. So probate is uh, simply the process the law prescribes to transfer assets when somebody passes away. Um, a will must be probated by the courts and it's triggered by an asset over $75,000 in the decedent's name alone with no beneficiary. So right now, 
that threshold amount to trigger a probate is $75,000, but it, it does change. When I first started practicing, it was only $50,000. It's, it's since increased to $75,000. Um, again, when it comes to um, you know, whether or not, even if it's intestate succession, where you pass away without a will, generally speaking, a probate is only triggered um, upon the surviving spouse's passing because generally everything is jointly titled or you've named each other as beneficiaries. So I would say typically a probate is only triggered upon the surviving spouse. But if the, the first spouse to pass away, if they had assets that were just in their name alone with no beneficiary designation, and it was over that $75,000 amount, it could trigger a probate to get it, uh, or basically to, to gain access to those assets. So that's just simply all that probate is. It's just simply the process the law prescribes to transfer assets when somebody passes away. Next up, I wanna discuss how does it actually work? So how does the actual probate process work? So you can have an informal probate and you can have a formal probate. An informal probate is just simply filing the documents with the court registrar there's no court hearing. It's simply preparing the documents, getting them all ready in order, opening the file of the courthouse. The court reviews the documents, and generally they sign off on it and provide you with a letter's testamentary. The letter's testamentary are what allow you to actually gain access to any of the assets that were in the deceased person's name alone. Um, can be done both testate and intestate. So you can do things informally if you have a will and without a will. If you don't have a will, everyone's gotta be in agreement. Again, because if there's a circumstance where, um, like say two children have equal priority, they need to be in agreement as to whether they're gonna to serve together maybe as, as co-personal representatives or one serving um, over the other. So it can be done informally um, by intestate, but everyone's gotta be in agreement. So formal probate, a formal probate means that there's actually a court hearing. So essentially you petition the court for the appointment of personal representative. Um, generally a formal probate is done um, when you can't find the original will. So that's something that you wanna keep in mind. You really wanna keep a good handle on your original documents. Um, if your estate triggers a probate and you have a will, but we can't find the original, it's definitely gonna increase costs because there's going to have to be a court hearing. Um, another reason why you would have a formal probate is to determine, to, to determine priority if people have equal priority. So again, this would be a circumstance if there's some family disharmony and say the children both think that they should be responsible um, you know, and there's a lot of fighting, et cetera. Um, that's when we need to get the court involved to basically kind of duke it out. Um, you know, family, frankly, it doesn't, you know, all it does is create more costs, frankly. So it's, it's really important that you get an estate plan in place. Um, and then uh, also for formal probate, if there's any possibility of litigation or a will contest, somebody contesting um, the estate, that's generally done through formal probate, basically noticing everyone that there is going to be a hearing and somebody's going to be appointed as the personal representative. Next up, once somebody is appointed, now what? So after they've been appointed, whether it be in test state without a will or test state with a will, they get appointed as personal representative. Um, what is the process? So one of the things that they need to do is notifying interested parties. So it kind of depends on whether or not it's an informal or a formal probate for notifying interested parties. If it's an informal probate, you generally notify the parties after the fact. You applied to the court, you got appointed, and now you're notifying all the interested parties as to your appointment. And the interested parties generally would be um, anyone who's named in the will to receive something or any of your children. So even if they're not named in there, they are an interested party and they do need to be informed that um, your estate is going through probate. Um, notice to interested parties, when you do have a formal probate, that notice goes before you have the court hearing. 
Um, so everyone knows that this hearing is going to be taking place. Um, there's no hide the ball. You can't keep things a secret. You've got to notice all of the interested parties. So I referred to um, earlier the letters testamentary. That's what you get when you have a court appointment. And so that is the court document that authorizes the personal representative to act. So that would allow uh, the personal representative to work with a realtor to sell your house or to work with your financial advisor to liquidate your um, investments or basically it allows you to do anything that the person who had passed away could do if they were still alive. It's essentially, as my father used to say, the keys to the vault, it allows you to stand in their shoes, so to speak. Once you get the letters of uh, testamentary, essentially what you need to do then is collect the assets, kind of pool them together. So that would you know, generally involve selling the residence, liquidating stocks, et cetera. And then you've got to pay all final bills and taxes. So generally, you need to pay those final bills and taxes before you make a distribution. One of the other things that you have to do um, through the probate process is filing an inventory with the court. So the court has a general idea as to what assets are involved. There's a couple different ways, though, that you can avoid filing that inventory. Um, one of the things that you can do is you can file, uh, instead of filing the inventory with the court, which could become public record, um, because anything filed with a court is essentially public record. You could just mail an inventory to all of the um, heirs, all of those that are set to receive assets, um, or you can also waive an inventory if, it, well, depending on the circumstances, say if you are the only heir or only beneficiary, um, you obviously don't need to inventory, provide an inventory to yourself. So you could waive that inventory. One of the other things that you would do once you're appointed as personal representative is providing notice to creditors. And so essentially what you would do is you would publish um, a notice in the newspaper for unknown creditors. Essentially what that does is it provides creditors 120 days to submit a, a claim. So say for instance, if uh, your children are handling your estate, they publish the notice to creditors because they don't know what kind of you know, outstanding bills you may or may not have this kind of puts some finality to it. Um, after that 120 days has expired, those claims are barred. So that kind of, again, puts some finality to it. That way, if a creditor comes out of the woodwork years from now, um, your, your children or whoever handled the estate could say, well, I published the notice, the notice to creditors in the newspaper. I'm sorry, but you're out of luck. And then of course, the distribution. Um, so when it comes to the distribution of assets, there's a couple different ways generally that can be done. Um, but I would say the typical way that most people make distributions when they're personal representative is they generally do a, a large distribution initially, essentially to get the responsibility um, off their back. Um, so say for instance, if there was, uh, you know, the state was $100,000. So when somebody passed away, it's a nice even number, say $100,000. The personal representative may distribute, say, ninety thousand and hold ten thousand dollars in reserves for any final bills, taxes, etc. That's essentially just to get the money out to uh, the beneficiaries, the heirs, um, first, and also to kind of alleviate any of the um, pressure of the personal representing the personal representative managing um, the estate's money, or if the personal representative wanted. They could actually wait until the very end after all final bills, et cetera, have been paid, um, which could take you know, anywhere from six months to a year, if not longer, and, and do a distribution at the very end. Ultimately, the personal representative, they're in charge. They set the stage, not the beneficiaries. Next up, I want to talk about some misconceptions about probate. So the government does not receive anything beyond minimal court fees. So this is one of the most common questions that I ask that I get asked. Uh, people say, "Well, I don't I don't want to go through probate because I don't want the government to receive, um, you know, a share of my estate." Um, that is just not the case at all. The only sort of fees when you go through probate are minimal court fees. Um, I would say, you know, a typical estate probably only has about five hundred dollars. In, uh, in court fees. 
And the, the other fees, frankly, are attorney's fees. So the government doesn't get a portion or a share. Uh, probate does not trigger any taxes. It doesn't change any, any sort of issues in terms of taxation. Um, Arizona, the state of Arizona does not have state inheritance tax. Um, there are some states in the Midwest um, that do, definitely do have state inheritance tax. And federally, to have federal estate taxes, you need an estate over $12 million to trigger um, state or inheritance tax. Um, so actually, that is $12 million per individual. So as a couple, you could actually shield up to $24 million before incurring federal estate taxes. Um, as I said kind of uh, just a minute ago on the previous slide, it generally takes about six months to a year to settle an estate. Um, and the reason for that um, you know, is you have to take into account the, the notice to creditors that I was just talking about. Um, the notice to creditors, it takes 120 days to expire. Obviously, it takes some time to get the person appointed and to start gathering the assets, liquidating um, you know, the assets, selling the, the residence, that sort of thing. Um, and also, you know, paying the final bills and, and tax preparation. So that's why I say it's generally six months to a year, but it could be longer than that. Um, you know, sometimes you have to wait for the tax forms to come out to file those year end taxes. Um, or say, for instance, you've got uh, like an example of uh, there's an estate that's been open that I've been handling for quite some time where there's some property that's quite difficult to sell. It's just not a marketable property. It's been on the market now for several years. Um, and so it's just something that they, you know, the beneficiaries, they need to be patient just because of basically the, the type of asset that it is. So it could be, you know, real estate like that that could cause uh, delays or sometimes it's um, mineral rights, mineral interests can sometimes cause delays. Um, so it just kind of really depends on the circumstances and what kind of assets you have. The other thing that I want to point about point out is uh, attorney fees are not calculated by a percentage of the estate. In some states, that is the case. Um, I think it's in Pennsylvania, if I recall, that attorney fees um, to go through the probate process are calculated by the percentage of the estate. That's not the case here. The attorney takes an hourly fee for their services. So again, that's a very, very common misconception. Next up, I wanna talk about then avoiding probate. What are the reasons to avoid probate? Why do people always say you want, you should avoid probate, et cetera? Um, so sometimes it's a matter of privacy. So court records are public documents. So that's oftentimes, you know, when you see a celebrity pass away, um, oftentimes they have a trust. Um, they want their assets more, more private. That way they, they uh, wouldn't have to file an inventory with the court, kind of showing what kind of assets they had when they passed, passed away. Um, the other reason is that that notice to interested parties. So generally speaking, if a client comes in and they know that they want to disinherit a child, um, oftentimes it's easier and advisable to do that by setting up a trust, no matter what kind of assets they have, um, just because they won't have to be notified that their um, you know, parent had passed away. They won't be notified of any sort of court proceedings because um, essentially if you avoid probate, that's what you're trying to do is avoid any sort of court involvement. So that is another reason why um, you know, privacy may be a concern. If you're estranged from a child, if you can't find the child, um, that can really you know, cause some major issues if you're going through the probate process and you can't find those individuals. So sometimes that's why trust is advisable uh, just for privacy reasons. Um, what are the logistics? Probate is generally required in each state you own property. So just logistically speaking, sometimes you want to avoid probate. So say for instance, if you had real estate um, spread out across the country, um, it's advisable to have a trust because you could trigger a probate in every one of those states. So obviously you could save a pretty significant sum of money by doing so. And then last but not least, um, costs, avoiding attorney's fees and court fees. So um, again, even if you have a trust, you still may need some um, you know, court involvement depending on the circumstances. Um, your children still may need an attorney to help them with administering uh, the trust. 
but I would definitely say that trusted estate administration um, overall is generally more economical than probated estate administration. It's just less involved, so to speak. So how can you avoid probate? So there's a couple different ways that you can avoid probate. Um, and the, the primary way to do that is a revocable living trust. That being said, what are some of the downsides of the, of the trust? Well, a trust is definitely a way more complex document. The typical will that I draft is anywhere from about three to five pages. Um, pretty easy to read. Sure, there's um, some legalese and boilerplate in it. Um, but I would say the vast majority of my clients can read and understand a will and have an idea as to what it does. Uh, a trust, not so much. It's uh, generally at least the, the documents that I draft are approximately 18 to 20 pages. Um, there's a lot of legalese. There is still a lot of boilerplate, but there's a lot of um, custom provisions as well. So it is a far more complex document. Um, the other disadvantage of a trust is it requires upkeep. So when you have a trust, you need to title your assets in the name of your trust. With a will, you don't have to do anything like that. So with a trust, you have to title them in the name of your trust. So um, where I see issues where I've got clients that have trusts that trigger probate is because they didn't upkeep their trust very well. And so one of the ways that that's triggered that people you know, don't necessarily realize is oftentimes refinancing their home. So when they refinance their home, they take their uh, residence out of the trust, they refinance, and then they forget to put the property back in the trust or the financial institution doesn't put it back into the trust. And then they subsequently pass away and the property is just in their name alone and it triggers a probate. So that's kind of one of the disadvantages is there's some work involved when you have a trust. You've gotta be mindful of the trust, make sure your assets are titled in the name of your trust. Depending on the circumstances, you can still have a probate, even if you have a trust that's fully funded. So let me give you kind of a, a hypothetical. This is a real, um, actually, this isn't a hypothetical. This is a real life example. Um, so I had a client who recently passed away. He had a trust that was fully funded. He had all of the assets titled in the trust that, that uh, needed to be, but he passed away with mesothelioma and he had a wrongful death suit and some ongoing litigation um, from that mesothelioma. And so to basically complete that litigation, his estate needed to be probated because somebody needed to act on his behalf. And that's why a probate was triggered. So even though all of his assets were titled in the name of the trust, can, to continue that litigation, it was necessary to go through the probate process. So sometimes it's unavoidable, frankly. Um, then when it comes to the, you know, the living trust, it's essentially more, more money up front, but generally more economical in the long run. Another way that you can avoid probate is by putting beneficiary designations on all of your assets. And so I get this, um, you know, I get this mentioned to me quite often when I'm in my office and meeting with new clients and they say, well, I've got beneficiary designations on all my assets. All my IRAs have beneficiary designations. My bank accounts have um, beneficiary designations, my investments. Um, even some of them have beneficiary deeds on their residence, which essentially puts a beneficiary on the residence to your house. The problem sometimes with having these beneficiary designations is again, the logistics. So say for instance, you had four children all four children were named equally as beneficiary on literally all of your assets. The logistics come into play because essentially what you would do to receive those assets is you would submit a death certificate, say to the, your financial institution, the bank. The bank splits everything four ways and sends out the check, but there's no pot to pay any final bills and taxes out of. So the children have to work together to pay those final bills and taxes. So as you guys know, um, you know, if you guys have children, sometimes those children don't get along. Some of those children have more financial acumen than others. And so you can really kind of get into some issues there with beneficiary designations because they really have to all work together. The other part of the logistics, um, let's just use the beneficiary deed as an example. So 
that would be putting a beneficiary designation on your residence. So if you if you had four children and you put them as beneficiaries, um, you know, equally as tenants in common to your residence, when you go to sell the residence, it's going to take all four of those children working together to sell the property. Um, I would say probably the vast majority of you have bought and sold at least a couple properties um, or residences over your lifetime. You know, it's, um, it's not a fun experience. And if you have four people involved, it can really, really complicate things. And frankly, it only takes one of them to disagree with say the sales price, et cetera, to break the camel's back, so to speak, and stop the sale. The other way to avoid probate, um, generally not advisable, um, but if you have assets under the minimum threshold amount of $75,000, there are ways to avoid probate. Um, and that's simply by filing some affidavits um, basically with the financial institution. And essentially what it does is it's, it's um, the person who's entitled to receive those assets basically swears in an affidavit that they are the ones entitled to receive those assets and um, it avoids probate. So the courts, or actually the legislature put in that $75,000 threshold um, to basically make sure that smaller estates don't bog up the courts. So that's how, that's basically, I don't know how they came up with that $75,000 threshold, but if you have assets under that amount, um, there are sometimes other ways to gain access to that without bogging down the courts with the probate process. For those of you who are starting from absolute scratch and putting together an estate plan, these are some tips, um, some things that I want you to, to be thinking about. Um, so one of the primary things is who would you want to be in charge to settle your estate? So you need to start thinking about the actual logistics of how is that going to work? Do they have good financial acumen? Um, financial, financial acumen is more than just paying your bills on time. Um, you know, many of you probably already have, you know, auto pay, bill pay set up, um, and, and your children probably do. Paying your bills on time is not, is not good financial acumen. It needs to be more than that. Um, you know, the person needs to be organized. Um, if they have any familiarity putting together uh, power or not PowerPoint spreadsheets, um, if they're able to do, you know, simple accountings, et cetera, um, you, you know, I, I, you know, I don't know the age demographic of the people uh, listening to this presentation, but I would say the vast majority of people, um, younger generation at least, do not know how to balance a checkbook. If they can't balance a checkbook, how can they, you know, do an inventory and, you know, you know, be completely transparent with their transparent with their siblings, showing these are the assets that I collected, these are the bills that I paid, et cetera. So you do really need somebody with some financial acumen. The other thing that you want to think about is proximity. If you're, um, you know, if your children live, uh, you know, on the East Coast, it is very possible to settle the estate really without ever setting foot in the state of Arizona, but there's going to be a lot more rigmarole, a lot more hoops to jump through. So sometimes, you know, having somebody close to proximity to the state of Arizona or even uh, a resident of Arizona um, can help, but you need to weigh all of that. So just because somebody is close, maybe if they don't have good financial acumen, that's not a good fit. So you really need to kind of weigh out, um, figure out what is the best scenario for, for your particular circumstances. The other thing that you want to think about too is how old are they? What about their health? So for instance, if you've got maybe your sibling serving as your personal representative, um, maybe it's your older brother. Well, your older brother's older than you. You need to make sure that you've got a, a good backup to your brother. Um, you also need to you know, make sure, are they in good health? Do they have the ability to handle your estate? Would they even want to handle your estate? Um, would it take long enough that you know, maybe they're not really in a, a position to handle your state at that time based upon their age, or um, you know, they wanna retire and, and not have to deal with that sort of thing. So you really need to kind of weigh all those circumstances 
um, when you determine who you want to be in charge, whether that be a trust or a will. And then who do you want to receive your estate when you pass away? So, you know, you really need to kind of get an idea as to what happens. The vast majority of clients, you know, they say, and 99% of my clients will say, oh, well, you know, divided equally between the children, but they don't think anything beyond that. What happens if a child predeceases? Does it go to their children? Does it go to your in-law? Does it go to charity? Does it go to, um, you know, uh, an organization like Benavia? Does it go to um, Salvation Army, et cetera? So you need to kind of think about what are the circumstances if my primary beneficiaries pass away. If you have an existing estate plan, these are some tips for you. Absolutely review it. If you haven't looked at your will or your trust in a number of years, you absolutely need to take a look at it. Um, like I said, it may take a little while to kind of review it and figure out what the, the actual provisions are, but take your time, flip through it. You should probably be able to figure out or get a general idea as to how it's set up. If you don't understand uh, something or have questions, schedule an appointment with, with your attorney to review it. Um, it's really important that you review your documents. Um, it, it doesn't need to be done all the time. You know, it doesn't need to be done annually. Um, but if there's been any major changes in your life, death, birth, divorce, um, that's when you want to take a look at your documents, make sure that you've got um, contingencies in place. Those contingencies are still the way that you want them. Um, it's very, very, very important to review your estate plan. I realize that it's not a fun and exciting thing to do, um, but take it out, dust, you know, get the dust off of it, take a look at it. And then you need to reevaluate those provisions. So what has changed? If it's been a number of years since you've created your estate plan, do you have grandkids now? Um, do you want to include your grandkids? Um, did you have age requirements for distribution? So say, for instance, you had assets held in trust because your children were younger and you were trying to protect them from themselves. Um, do those need to be changed because um, you know, they're old enough and wise enough to manage assets on their own now? Um, or are there other circumstances? Do they have um, you know, drug addiction issues or um, mental problems or any sort of health issues? Are they receiving any government assistance? Um, because if they receive an inheritance, sometimes that can kick them off their government assistance. So you really just kind of need to evaluate things every so often. Um, just kind of make sure it's still set up the way that you want it. So in summary, the most important thing that I want to point out is probate really isn't the monster that many people create it out to be. It really doesn't cost that much in terms of fees. The cost difference, frankly, between um, you know probate and setting up uh, a trust is just a matter of a few thousand dollars. Um, so that's really the, the most important thing that I want you guys to take away from this is that probate isn't the monster that may, many people create it out to be. And it is possible that no matter how hard you try to avoid probate, depending on the circumstances, it may have to be triggered. Like that example that I, I was talking about with the client who had mesothelioma. Um, the other thing that I wanna um, you know, point out and, and hopefully you guys take away from this is that literally any plan is better than no plan at all. Um, don't let the state statutes determine who has uh, priority to settle the estate and who receives your assets. It's your assets. You're the one that worked hard for those assets. You decide who's in charge. You decide where those assets go. So literally any plan is better than no plan. Last, every estate plan is, is unique. There are so many different ways to, uh, to structure an estate plan with a variety of advantages and disadvantages. Um, just because your family or friends have a certain estate plan doesn't mean that's the best option for you. Next, we're going to open um, everything up to questions. Please limit your questions to a general topic and not a specific instance or a hypothetical. Um, and please be mindful of sharing any personal information um, with a group when you're asking a question. All right, Mike, you can minimize your screen. That was a great presentation. I really like all the um, 
the difference as you explained between because I think that's a hard question is what's the difference between probate advantages of that uh, will sure. versus a trust and it's kind of for us lay people it's kind of overwhelming so mm -hmm. as you know if any of you um, would like to talk to Mike personally at a different time about your situation I will be sending a follow-up email this week with his contact information so you could set up an appointment with him um, he will also um, give us the presentation so we can send it to all of you as a um, attachment and we will be putting it on the Benavia website as well. And there will be a recording available also. So um, thank you so much. I'm gonna open up this chat box here if any of you had questions. Um, I think I just answered Janine's question. She said it's a great presentation. She wanted to know if it would be available. Um, Sandy's asking when there are no relatives left, who does your estate go to? Would so, it be good a question. And she said, would it be a significant other? No. Those are two um, questions, really. Sure. So a significant other would never be included. It follows the bloodline. So a significant other would never be included if you passed away without an estate plan. If there are no relatives left, it has to be literally no relatives, no cousins, um, et cetera. Then it would escheat to the state. That is extremely rare. Um, during my father's time in practicing, it happened. It's only happened twice, and I've only seen it happen once in the entire time um, since I've been practicing. So it's extremely, extremely rare. So um, what should someone do then if they if they want to leave their stuff to a significant other? What are the ways they can do that? So absolutely, get get an estate plan set up, um, whether it be a simple last will and testament. Um, or a trust. That's how you make sure that assets go exactly how you want and not following the bloodline pursuant to statute. Okay, sounds good. Okay, someone's asking, um, will we have, we have a will prepared in Colorado and now that we live in Arizona, do we need a new will? Um, so see, I see Sandy said cousins too. So yes, that would include cousins. I mean, it would have oh, to be- Oh, I'm sorry. I no them. descendants whatsoever. Um, but Tom, um, generally speaking, if your estate planning documents were prepared in another state and they were properly executed in that state, um, they're generally still valid in the new state that you're living in. But I generally recommend that you get your documents updated, um, especially when it comes to your powers of attorney. Your powers of attorney are likely making reference to um, Colorado um, health statutes, et cetera. Um, so at the very least, maybe get your powers of attorney updated. Those are pretty, um, you know, reasonable documents. It's a pretty reasonable fee to get those updated and then have an attorney review, um, you know, your current will, just make sure there's no issues, um, any red flags that they see. Okay, so we have quite a few questions here. We're going to try to hit... Um all of them so if you've already asked one question i would ask you to hold off asking any more right now so we can be fair to other people um we have a question um it says can an attorney help me to decide what estate plan is best for me i'm not sure i understand that question exactly do you mike know what what that person um, might be which one maybe, is it? Uh, maybe she means whether they should do probate or have a trust. Maybe that's what she means. It says, can they, a state attorney help me decide which one is, which estate plan is best for me? I, I would say that's pretty much the case. Yeah, what, I mean, that, yeah. that's that's kind of generally, that's what the attorney is supposed to do yeah. is, is help you decide. Um, you know, sometimes it's a circumstance where um, clients are kind of right in the middle, whether or not a will or trust is appropriate. Um, and so ultimately the client will have to make that decision. But, um, you know, the attorney should be able to kind of help you weigh the, the pros, the cons, et cetera. Um, but, but yeah, any attorney should be able to kind of help you choose what's going to be mm -hmm. the best for you. Okay. Some of these are more specific in nature, and I think you might have to reach out to Mike personally. For example, there's one that says informal probate, um, a letter of testamentary about advanced death. That's a little more specific, um, BJ, so if you might direct that to Mike a different time. Um, so I'd, I can actually go through some of these pretty easily. Like, so Leanne, she wants to know, is there any way an ex-spouse would inherit? Um, 
not through intestate, not through state statutes, because you have to actually be a spouse, but it would be possible for an ex-spouse to inherit some of your assets. Say, for instance, if you uh, got divorced and you never changed the beneficiary designation on uh, some of your assets, say your life insurance policies. So it is very possible if you didn't uh, change the beneficiary designation in your life insurance policy, an ex-spouse could inherit. Um, would their father inherit and then ex inherit from them? I'm not sure about your, I, I don't quite understand your hypothetical there, but it, it would not go to an ex-spouse. Um, let's see, some of these are just kind of an estate a statement. We have a, uh, prepared a will, but not through an attorney. Um, so, you know, there's nothing preventing people from creating documents on their own um, or going to a document preparer. Um, you know, obviously an attorney's got uh, a number of, you know, years of education and they've got uh, malpractice insurance that they have to basically, you know, do to actually practice law. Document preparers, they don't have that education. They don't have that malpractice insurance. If they make a mistake, you're just kind of out of luck. And in terms of preparing it on your own, um, I know it's kind of a silly example, but it's the example that my father used. Um, he always used the example, you know, if you needed to go to the dentist and get your tooth pulled, um, you know, you could have the dentist do it, or you could go to the hardware store and get a pliers and do it yourself. Achieves the same goal. Um, but there's a right way and there's a wrong way to do things. Sometimes by saving a few hundred dollars, you can cause several thousand in legal fees if it's not done properly. Um, let's see, for informal probate, can one receive a letter of testimony in advance of debt? Absolutely not. How and where do we record the will? So the will is absolutely, is actually never recorded. It's not recorded with the uh, county recorder. The only time it's filed is actually when you go through the probate process. So for instance, if an estate completely avoided probate because they had a trust, um, there would be no record of a will being filed, so to speak. So I think um, hopefully that kind of answers your question. Um, any further questions, any follow-ups? I'm more than happy to take any other questions or. Can you hear me, Mike? Yeah. It's in the, I didn't get it on the chat. Well, I don't know why. Sure. But my question was, why is a revocable living trust more economical than a will? Um, just basically because you're avoiding those court fees and the attorney's fees. Um, the reason that it's more economical is oftentimes the trustee can do a lot of the distribution and working with the beneficiaries completely on their own, basically without involving an attorney. Okay, and one other question. Um, sure. You talked about uh, having the notice in the paper for the creditors. Mm -hmm. Do you yep. have to do that even if you're um you already have a will and or trust um so if you have a trust it's not required if you go through probate it is required to uh publish notice to creditors in the newspaper unless basically the statute of limitations for the creditors to submit a claim has already expired so if they haven't submitted a claim in more than two two years after your passing um you don't have to publish notice to creditors in the newspaper okay thank you Mm -hmm. So this is Daphne. I wanted to mention something um, why my family, myself and my parents and my aunt and uncle decided to do a trust is because they give you an opportunity sometimes to do things like your um, power of attorney, your medical power of attorney, your financial power, um, financial power of attorney, a living will, advanced directives. Those are things that they'll go through with you um two to like help you get those documents all in a row so we have a notebook that has our trust and it has all that too and sometimes if you do stuff on your own you don't know all of what to do and what has to be notarized and signed and so right now we're dealing with some health issues with my family and truthfully at the hospital they ask you know you know do you, you know who has the power of attorney here to help make decisions and we're having some mental um, dementia and so forth in our family too. And so sometimes there's that medical mental illness 
power of attorney too. So that's another thing as you age, that's nice to have all that. Wouldn't you say, Mike? Um, yeah, no, absolutely. And, and especially too, if you're creating documents on your own, like powers of attorney, um, it's really important too, that if you create a new one, you've got to revoke the previous one. Otherwise, technically you could have dueling powers of attorney um, with two people with basically equal authority to make decisions. Um, that's how you wind up in litigation. Um, someone's asked about speaking about fiduciaries, about the role of a fiduciary, if you don't have anyone at all to uh, take over when you become, you know. Um, yeah, so fiduciaries are an absolutely amazing tool. Um, and it just kind of depends on the circumstances if they'd be a good fit for somebody. So fiduciary by definition is somebody who acts in the best interest of somebody else. And so historically where um, you used to kind of see the fiduciaries come into play in Sun City is that, uh, at least this is what my father has told me, is that um, he would see fiduciaries helping out with uh, school teachers that retired in Sun City that were never married and, that, and had no children they didn't really have anybody to handle their estate. And that's where fiduciaries would come into play. Where I'm um, seeing fiduciaries um, more recently is when um, you know, clients have some children that, that really don't have the financial acumen to handle an estate, um, or if they don't have anybody, uh, fiduciary is a good fit. Or um, like an example, uh, just yesterday I had a client who has macular degeneration. And so she doesn't have anyone to kind of help her out, but some friends and her friends are approximately her age as well. She's uh, in her, uh, she's going to be 80 here quite soon. So she's getting up there in age and so are, so are her friends. And I explained to her, I said, you know, this is a big undertaking. She, she said in about six months, she's probably going to lose her eyesight uh, due to macular degeneration she needs to get a plan in place right now. Um, and a fiduciary is somebody who could really put a good plan in place, make sure that she gets to her doctor's appointments, make sure her bills are getting paid properly, basically just making sure, being her eyes, so to speak, to make sure things get done properly. Um, she just doesn't have, uh, you know, she doesn't have a family to, to kind of support her and do that for her. And that's really where a fiduciary would be an excellent fit. And just a little plug for Benavia here. One of the things I didn't mention is we have a referral line that's free of charge. Just call the main number for Benavia. And if you need um, a referral to, you know, in individuals that are fiduciaries that are helping, like Mike mentioned, not just managing a state, but actually helping people who live by themselves, who are widowed or widowers, who have no one to help them if their health declines you know, and they have to even possibly make decisions about end of life and so forth if there's no one that can do that for them. So um, we do have sessions about fiduciary. So keep your eye out on the website um, and so forth because, you know, we do have speakers from those agencies talking, but call us if you want a referral to one agency that we would suggest. Okay. Um, so a couple other questions here. One from Sandy about uh, kind of a specific uh, circumstances, I take it with her where she has PODs or TODs on all assets. Um, I would absolutely recommend at least getting a simple will in place because if you forgot to put a beneficiary on an asset and depending on the asset's uh, value, it could trigger a probate. Whether or not you want to hire a professional, that's up to you. Um, Michael wants to know, can you describe the process of filing a beneficiary deed? Um, I mean, I, I think what you mean is is recording a beneficiary deed, um, uh, recording any document with the county recorder. Um, it's been changed a little bit just due to COVID. They used to have recording kiosks throughout the Sun City area where you could basically scan the document, speak to a, uh, a representative at the county recorder and record documents basically remotely. Um, as far as I know, those are, those are no longer open, and I don't believe you can actually go down to the county recorder's service desk to record um, even quite yet. So the way I've been recording documents, at least for the past two years, is simply just mailing them in. 
So if you have a beneficiary deed and you want to record it, you mail it in with uh, the recording fee and that should file it. But, um, you know, depending on, again, it's anytime you produce documents on your own, um, like producing a beneficiary deed, um, I, I've definitely experienced and seen some issues where clients have tried to, you know, produce them on their own. Uh, deeds are really complicated documents. You don't want to mistake, make a mistake there. Mike, um, just one more. Um, is it better to have one person as your personal representative than two, like after in a second sure. marriage, one person from this family and one from that family? Can they work in together? The Sure. So I understand those circumstances, you know, blended families are getting more and more prominent. And so I definitely see those circumstances where you have people from different sides of the family. Um, I personally don't think that it's a good idea. Um, you know, some people say two heads are better than one. The converse to that is too many cooks in the kitchen make a mess. <laughs> yeah. You have co-personal representatives. That means both of them are going to have to sign documents. Um, mm -hmm. It just is going to generally create more complexity. Um, and frankly, more costs. You know, anytime you have more personal representatives, more beneficiaries, there's going to be more costs um, just because that's simply um, more communication to individuals, more correspondence, et cetera. Mike, but you're supposed to have backups, right? So, like, you should have more than one because someone could pass, right? So, how many do you sure. suggest? How many do you suggest that you have? And, like, it kind of depends. Yeah, it kind of depends on your cir your circumstances. You know, if you only have two kids and you don't want to take it out any further than that, that's fine. Um, you know, that's more than enough. So, it, you know, it kind of depends on the age of your your backups and, and that sort of thing. I mean, if you had six children, I don't think that it's necessary to name all six of the kids. Um, you know, on, in certain circumstances, say if uh, a client has three children, I'll name all three of them just so um, you know, the, the last one doesn't feel left out or missed that they weren't included in the documents. Um, but yeah, I generally recommend one person as the uh, trustee, one person as the executor, one person making any decisions for anything. All right, well, a lot of good questions. I think that people really appreciated your presentation, got a lot out of it. Like I sure. said, I will send a follow-up and um, you can look over things and there might be things that you think of at that time, you could reach out to Mike personally um, to see if you can set up an appointment with him. Um, and also we'll give you the benefit of re resources that you could contact if you need to try to find out if you need to find a fiduciary or so forth. So thank you so much for attending today and just keep a lookout on our website for additional educational events that you might want to participate in. And thanks again, Mike, we really appreciated your uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Bye everyone. Bye everyone. Thank Bye. you. <laughs>